People feel data rich and insights poor. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Apply Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at terraleap.io. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my guest, Stephen Smith, who's based in Palo Alto. He's the CEO at Kitman Labs. Welcome, Stephen. Good to have you on. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Alexander. Now, Kitman Labs is an analytics platform, and you're focused on generating insights to help professional athletes perform better. Um, help me understand, Stephen, like what was the problem that you saw and set out to solve? Yeah, um, the problem was big, right? I, I think you know, I, I come from a background working in sports medicine and strength conditioning. Um, spent my entire career working in professional sport prior to this company. Um, I think when I started in sport, um, there was very little data being collected. Um, you know, I think the, the the electronic medical records product of choice at that point in time in, in my club was a whiteboard. So the injuries would get written on a whiteboard and, you know, when they would get fixed, they would wipe them away. And that was, uh, that was where they went. And, uh, you know, the, how we tracked what was happening in training was, uh, you know, stop watching a whistle and we would write down how many minutes we were on the field for. And, um, you know, so it was sports come a long way over the last 15 to 20 years. And, when, uh, when we we first started on, on kind of our journey with the club that I was involved in, um, with a new head coach who came in and he asked a lot of questions about, you know, what types of injuries are occurring? You know, when did they occur? How did they occur? What position groups picked them up? You know, how long did they last for? He also had a lot of questions about what does a physical profile of a professional athlete look like? You know, how much better do they get when we bring them in? How does that vary by position group? Um you know, where, how, where do we make them strong? Where do we make them weak? What does the fitness profile look like? You know, and what does that look like for somebody who has a five-year career versus somebody that has a 10, 15-year career? So he had all of these questions and you know, we had very little answers, very little data, very little information. So I think we, you know, at first the mandate was, can we digitize the athlete life cycle? Um, start to, to gather and document what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So what year was back, this? This was back in 2007, 2007, 2008. And in, at that point in time, um, we actually became the first Northern Hemisphere team of any sport to use GPS technology on athletes, to use wearable sensors on athletes. And, and that was a huge step forward because we went from having an understanding of the fact that you know a practice session lasts for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever it was, to now having 300 data points on our athletes 60 times a second um, of, across all of our athletes. So, you know, we were drinking from a fire hose pretty, pretty fast. And, you know, we knew what distances they were traveling. We knew how many times they were stepping off their left foot, off their right foot. We knew the number of accelerations, decelerations, the number of collisions. And I think one of the, you know, one of the first things that occurred to us um, was like a sense of being overwhelmed, right? We had all this data and really we, we ended up kind of looking at some pretty simplistic metrics, like the total distance somebody ran or, you know, the amount of kind of high speed running that was happening, like very simplistic things. And just looking at, you know, how that would change over time. And, um, but we, you know, we knew we weren't really leveraging it correctly. And we started also performing strength profiling. We started collecting biomechanical data, bloods and hormonal profiling, um, psychological data, um, you know, recovery, testing data. Um, so you, you name it. We went from basically nothing to like collecting 64 streams of independent data. And, oh, well, well, <laughs> yeah, every day. And I think that left us in a position where we realized that there was, there was just so much. There was probably too much. And also what was happening was it was starting to become weaponized. So different practitioners would use the data to tell different stories that supported their mandate within the environment. So, you know, if a fitness coach saw it or a strength and condition coach saw it, oftentimes we would, we would look at the athletes who hadn't done as much, you know, distance and hadn't, you know, covered as much accelerations or decelerations and just didn't get the same physical stimulus from a session. And we would look at that and think, okay, well, maybe we need to do more with them. And the, the sports medicine side will look at the opposite and see, okay, well, this guy's done more than everybody else. You know, maybe they need to do less. And the reality was we didn't actually know whether one should be doing more, or one should be doing less. And we weren't factoring in all the other things about those athletes. And, and, you know, I think we were just, we were just looking at stories and building narratives and we wanted to do better. So um, I set out on performing my master's thesis um, on the whole concept of, combined risk factors as predictors of athletic injury. 
So we took the di diagnostic code from a medical record and started to build pattern identification around that with the what we were the stress and strain and load that we were placing on our athletes and then how they were recovering and responding. And then we started to use that that the modeling for decision making. Um, we, we had a pretty significant reduction in injuries, just over thirty percent year on year for two years. Subsequently, went on to win our first European Cup, and then won three more European trophies whilst I was there. And that was kind of the start. I mean, I, that was the start of it. And I'm not saying that our technology and what we were doing that was the secret sauce, right? Um, I'm a realist, right? I think we had incredible talent, we had like, incredible athletes, we had incredible coaches, we had great game strategy, we had a superb culture. You know, we had all the right ingredients, but we were also making an impact, and we were keeping our best talent on the field, and that was helping us basically to capitalize on on the opportunity that you know collectively as a whole we were building. Um, so that, that's kind of where it all started. <laughs> There, there, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and in the journey is obviously the, the insight that started the whole piece. When it comes to data science in sports, for me personally, and, and I, I imagine maybe for some others, the, the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt, um, that was maybe the first introduction. Oh, wow, you can use all this, uh, all these data points and whatever coming into it. Is that similar to, to this or, or is it just completely different? Yeah, I think it was a similar approach in that, you know, what Billy Bean and, and you know, Paul Podesta and that crew were doing at the, at the A's was they were trying to, you know, take, you know, digitize what, what the, you know, baseball athletes are doing on the field. They were trying to basically, you know, pin down objective numbers that led them to understand what performance looked like. And they were using it to try and find value in the, in the market and make the right trades and get the right, the right people that could deliver the right performance we started from a different angle, but ultimately it's exactly the same concept, right? Can we, can, instead of re relying on our gut instinct and experience, which are, are really important, can we support that instinct with data? Like, can we support that with objectivity and can we inform the decisions or can we guide our intuition and support our intuition um, with numerical data to validate or invalidate what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're feeling, what we're thinking? So I, I think in many ways, um, the, the approaches are, are, are very synergistic. Those in, in sports management, those who are leading the different teams, are, are they, did they quickly recognize and jump on this data and say, yes, we need more data. We need more analytics on what our, what our, what our team members are doing. Yeah, I think at the start, what we saw when we first started doing this, we saw teams were like, yes, the data revolution is here. Let's jump in. Let's get knee deep. Let's do this. And I think that very quickly got to the point where people were like, well, now I have it all. What, what am I actually going to do with it? So I, I think across, it. Yeah, across the world of sport today, people feel data rich and insights poor. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the things that we're most excited about within this industry is, is helping, people, helping people and helping this industry to mature, right? It's not just about data collection. It's not just about building a data landscape. That data is useless and the investment that you're making in it is useless unless we can you know really start to cultivate that and really do something powerful with it and turn it into turn it into impact now starting uh in in dublin Ireland as this a rehabilitation coach is that right injury rehabilitation coach yeah rehab was my specialty so i have like an athletic training background and then a strength conditioning um certification as well so i came from both sides and ended up like working on injury prevention and rehabilitation as my specialty and, and you start uh, Kipman Labs um, while you're still there. Is that right? 2012, I think I see a number here. Yeah. Um, as, but you're still there till 2014. So it was like while you were there, you begin this? Yeah, exactly. So we actually founded the company, kicked it off whilst I was still working full-time in sport because I, I, I didn't start this company and think, okay, we are, you know, we're going to go and build this, you know, huge global company and raise all this money and have hundreds of people working for us and, you know, all, all of these things that have happened. I started it because I was passionate about solving a problem and, and still am today. And, and uh, I actually had approached the club to look for funding to build what we wanted to build internally and they, they couldn't afford it at that point in time. So we you know, ended up going and raising some capital to do it because I was just so passionate about it. Um, but I, I also loved what I did every day. Like I'm a practitioner at heart and I love being on the ground with athletes and I love like being in that environment. There's something quite special about it. And I think that's also that, that that's a it's a really important part of the culture and of our organization is that we are at our heart a group of elite practitioners who have you know worked at the top level in sport and believe that this industry deserves better. 
Um, and, and I think that that's one of the things that makes us very different from anybody that, that we've ever seen in this industry. And it's why I think we're approaching this problem from a very different angle, because we're not a group of business people or just a group of business people. We're not just a group of technologists, you know, at our heart and soul, we're, we're practitioners. Mm-hmm. You, you start with rugby. Does it, does the concept of what you're applying translate to every sport? Yeah, I mean, what we're what we're doing is essentially understanding human performance, right? At, at its at its soul, that like that's what we're doing is understanding human performance and human failure. And you know, I suppose we we started in rugby because that's where I came from. Very quickly, we bled into uh, football or or soccer, as we now call it, call it over here. Um, and it started to scale from there. Now, I think I don't know. We work across twenty five plus different sports. Um, and the reality is, even if you look at it, like at the start, we had a lot of people poking at that saying, oh, you're just a rugby company or you're just a soccer company. And, you know, performance is different to everybody, even within a rugby environment. You know, like, you know, if you think about this from an NFL perspective, if you walked into the Patriots locker room or you walked into the New York Giants locker room, their version of performance, their definition of performance is different. So, you know, how Bill Belichick wants his team to play, the strategy that they're going to deploy, how they're going to pick apart the opponent, that's going to be completely different than, say, Urban Meyer at the, at the Jags. But they're, all of these, like, coaches, their, their definition of the perfect game and what that looks like, that is different. And therefore, what we, our, our role is to come in and support that and, and not do that in an off-the-shelf way, right? There is no one-size-fits-all at this level of elite sport. So our role is to come in and understand what is that perfect vision of performance? How do they want them to play? You know, how fast do they need to be to do that? How powerful do they, do they need to be to do that? How do they need to practice and train like in the build up to that, to be able to exhibit that version of performance that they have in, in the perfect, you know, how resilient do they need to be to be able to carry out that game plan and that strategy to that effect against different types of opposition, et cetera. So, you know, when you start to understand it like that and look at it like that, that every team is unique, it's not really about the sport. Of course, there are uniqueness that we need to understand. And there's context that's incredibly specific to each sport. But really what we're doing is like we're building this unique system for how we basically help people to understand, you know, how they optimize performance, how they develop performance, how do they identify the right talent for that particular type of performance and how they keep their athletes resilient to, to, to be able to, to play and, and, and display that performance. If I understand correctly, your Kipman's lab, your, your lab, your athlete management system is, it has 150 data integrations. Is that right? Yeah, so our, 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 you know, as we we call our system, the athlete management system is not necessarily the phrase that we would use for what we do. In our mind, you know, what we've seen in the industry, athlete management systems are basically just data platforms. They're first generation legacy databases that just consume information, and they, you know, produce static insights on top of that, or reports or visualizations on top of that data. So they're smart databases configured for sport. And um, we build an intelligence platform, and that's a really important distinction because. We believe in everything here is about intelligence. It's not about bringing your data together. It's not about putting in a database. It's not about visualizing it. It's not about technology, right? The technology for us is a tool, right? What it's all about is intelligence. How do we get the right information to the right people at the right time to empower the right decisions? And that, there's, a, there's a very distinct difference between data and intelligence. And um, for us, you know, our... our that that is a, a really really important distinction because everything that we do is geared towards helping people to leverage that, and and obviously at the, the you know 150 plus I don't know it's far more than that at this point integrations. If we can't cultivate all of that data, if we can't bring that data together, if we can't bring all of the information in, we can't actually generate robust insights of that that are intelligent, right? We're we're just building a very narrow myopic view of of a specific piece of data. So the key to unlocking this industry and unlocking intelligence is, is by having a holistic, comprehensive data set that, you know, that's living and breathing and growing every day. You put the emphasis on intelligence. Can you give me a use case or an example of, of it in play, this data, not just, okay, hey, look at this pretty dashboard, but how, how is a team actually using this? Yeah, from from our perspective, like you know that that intel like that whole intelligence piece and what that means for athletes, like it means better management, right? Plain and simple. Like imagine you're an athlete, right, and you walk into a training facility feeling sore and tired. What do the coaches do with that piece of information? What do the medics do? Like what does the strength coach do? Do you train? Do you play? Are you sent home? Do you rest? Does your practice plan change? 
The reality is, right, there's a ton of context needed to answer that question. They need to know how you normally sleep. They need to know how sore you normally are. They need to know what happened to affect your sleep or your soreness. They, you know, they need to know what is a practice plan for day and what are you needed for and when are you next playing and when did you last play and what's your current performance level at. And in real life, these decisions are happening tens of times a day and decisions are being made in seconds. And we, like the role that we play is we provide teams with the ability to make those decisions educated. And that is like changing the way teams are fundamentally operating. We're, we're helping them to turn that data into intelligence. So we're helping to bring all of those pieces together. We're allowing all of those different practitioners, the medics, the strength and conditioning coaches, the technical and tactical coaches, we're allowing them all to develop this shared understanding of data. And then we're building research tools that allow them to understand, well, what does that mean? So in that, that small, that small little unique one piece of information that this person is feeling sore and tired today, well, does that matter? Or well, how do we know if it matters? We know if it matters by actually asking the question of what's happened in previous scenarios like this before. What does that actually result in? Can they actually like can they get the, the achieved or desired like training stimulus from that? Are they going to break because of that? And if you think of the amount of data sources that are needed to holistically answer that question. And the number of people that need to be informed because the coach needs to decide what they're going to do. The strength and conditioning coach needs to decide what to do. The medic is, needs to decide what they're going to do. And they also, the, the, the ramification of what, what that person do, does impacts all of the other athletes as well and their plan. They need to be able to make a very coordinated decision about what's happening and what happens for everybody else like that. Mm-hmm. And how do you do that when you have 50, 60 different streams of data and you have it for every athlete and you have to make decisions for it's not just one athlete showed up now actually there's 10 athletes that have 10 different things going on on this particular day and in this moment and you're seeing them for a number of minutes before your practice day starts so bringing that together turning that into discernible information and providing insights that empower those decisions in seconds that that's what we do it's simply as as the medic or the the strength coach can just open up the dashboard and they can uh, type in what they're looking for or what's happening and then gives them insights or are they looking at uh, analytics? W- what is that experience? Yeah. So I suppose it's different within every environment, right? And also it's worth noting that like, it's not, you just don't turn this, like open your laptop and then boom, it's there, right? You know, on, on, on day one, right? There's some work that goes on to, to bring all of that data together. There's work that goes on to basically analyze that data and understand what it means. And then basically we build, we build out visualizations and workflow tools internally within the product to allow them to, and to then utilize that day to day. So when somebody does wake up, they walk in, they have their laptop, there might be specific metrics that they're looking at or specific insights that they're looking at that they see, oh, this person is outside of where we would like that person to be at. They see that, they can click in, they see exactly what's going on. They can have a discussion about that as a collaborative high performance team. And then they're able to go and make the decision off the back of that. So a lot of these organizations, um, just like if you were working in, I don't know, like a, you know, an engineering, you know, an engineering company or a software development company in the morning time, your staff might come together and go like, okay, here's our action plan for today. Here are the pieces that we're working on. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. And it's exactly the same thing in a high performance environment. People generally have those status meetings in the morning to say, okay, where's everybody at? What's the, what's, what, what do our, our group look like? You know, who's feeling, you know, who's feeling tired, who's feeling sore, how have people pulled up after yesterday, how's that injury tracking? So these status briefings happen, and we're basically providing the insights that allow them to guide those, make them really efficient, make their decisions, and then move forward and execute on their plan. Those that are are looking for future careers in in sports management, careers of of managing teams in different places and and ways, is it just going to be the norm now that you're just going to always be able to have these uh, a dashboard and be able to go in and, and and be able to drill down to find the exact answers and and will it be just that that is the future 100 percent. i mean it has to be right that's the bet that we're making and that's the role that we're playing in the market like you know if you were if you were working in wall street 20 years ago right it was done very differently than than it is today right you know the, the how they looked at stocks and trades and how it was like how it's happening now all of that's happening right in front of an interface if you look at the insurance industry and how like policies are priced, if you look at the airline industry, if you look at how we, how we like, how we book a taxi today, we used to stand at the street with our hand up right today. Now we're like, if we look at how we rent movies, like we basically sit there with a remote control in front of us or our phones or our tablets. Whereas we used to like walk down to the video store and pick it off the shelf. All of this is changing. And this is a natural evolution. And the, the reality is as well, 
we don't want people who have spent five, six, seven years in university studying a specific trade like sports medicine and then going and spending 15 years building a craft. We don't want them spending hours at a laptop every day. We want them deploying their skills, working with athletes, treating athletes, you know, working on preventative medicine, working on rehabilitative medicine, having conversations with coaches and pushing that organization forward. The last place that we want them is sitting in front of a laptop. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's the, our role is to come in and automate and provide those, intel- like those insights, provide that intelligence and empower people to, to, to utilize their skills in the best way they can. You, you're trying to remove <laughs> the, the technology that it's just, it's just there allowing, just allowing you to do your, your job better. But when it comes to, to, to all these stats and these wearables that they're wearing and this data that's coming in, is it, are we there yet where it's just automated? Like it just gets in there or is there a lot of manual entry that needs to happen still? Yeah, for the vast majority of it today, it's pretty automated. Um, you know, the m- most products within this space today have like APIs and information just flows backwards and forwards, right? So like any like any other space. And with every passing day, that's getting better and better, right? So, you know, I think there's there's more automation, there's more fidelity to the data, there's more granularity to it, there's more consistency, there's less errors. Um, so I, I you know, I don't worry about data quality, data consistency. Um, within this industry any longer, you know, I, I think, you know, the biggest, the biggest place that people need to focus their attention to is intelligence. This, this um, conversation, uh, conversation of being able to understand and, and how da- this data affects this person so that we can make an educated decision. Is it, is it across all people? Like, are you able to take the learnings from, all the players everywhere that's in the system and and be able to apply that learning and, and give access to that or is it really only relevant per individual like only that person's data really matters yeah it's a great question the, the reality is that both right i think there is power in the larger aggregated data set and the learnings that we can make across larger cohorts of people but you also have to understand that every organization has different uh, different data sources, different data quality, different data consistency. So the insights that you can derive off larger pools of data are not always totally ubiquitous. Um, so you can make like you can make good insights from that. But in terms of how does that apply, what we really care about is understanding the individual response and under understanding the in- individual. So if we can take like large scale learnings from a bigger pool. And then if we can go and refine that then for each individual, that's what we really care about. And that's what perfect looks like. Um, and, and that's, that's the approach that we take today. The question, are we getting to the question of just trying to, how do, how do we build the best athlete? Is that the question being asked? Yeah. Um, I think it's like, what does the perfect, like what does perfect performance look like? And how do like, I don't know if it's like, the per, like are we building the best athlete? because performance is different, because different coaches want different things, like depending on the way you play, you may need to be faster, you may need to be more powerful, you may need to be more reactive, you may need to be stronger, you may need to have more endurance, like all of these variables, like there's, you know, there's trade-offs, like the, you know, you know a marathon runner doesn't look like a sprinter for a reason, right? So all of like the, these decisions that we make about the way we want to play the game, you know, have like ramif- like physiological and, and neuromuscular ramifications. So what we care about is basically helping people to develop that perfect performance, but that for like, whatever that definition of perfect performance is, it's generally different within different environments. And, and, and that's, I think that's again, something that is quite unique to our organization. I think everybody, like a lot of other organizations that we've seen want to want to give a one size fits all approach. You want to say, this is how you do it in football. And this is how you do it in basketball. And this is how you do it in baseball. And the reality is, I think, you know, we, we as an industry deserve more and our role within the industry is to give people more. Um, and, you know, we, we very definitely believe because of all of these reasons, right. It, it isn't like people talk about this as sports science or they talk about it as analytics. It's not, this is all about performance intelligence. And I feel like, you know, five, 10 years ago, people talked about the bit, you know, we're in the age of big data, the big data revolution is here, blah, 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 blah. I think like we are very definitely in the age of performance intelligence now. And, you know, the teams that are adopting this mindset and this philosophy, and basically they're not looking at this as a departmental piece. They're not saying we need a performance science department. They're saying we need to leverage intelligence across every aspect of what we do in in the high performance sphere. That's what good looks like. It's not a departmental thing. It's not something that you put on one person. It's not about hiring a sports scientist. It is about organizational change and gearing your organization to leverage intelligence. 
I'm coming from a very limited experience with sports. Some of our viewers, I think we split of some already know a lot more than I do about sports. Others may be in my boat. Help me understand, is it just de facto standard? Every sports team now is, is digging into this data, using it, or are there any outliers that it, it's actually not common yet? Yeah, I think every organization is using data to some extent. Is any organization maximizing the potential of their data? Very few, right, I think. But that again, like it's it's quite a young industry, right? Think about you know where we were in two thousand and seven with like paper and pencil for like you know there was there was no wearable sensors, there was no optical trackers, there was no RFID. So for an industry to like travel so far over the space of fifteen years, like it's big, right? So of course there's going to be a lag. Also, like when you think about it, if you look at the companies that kind of have evolved in this space, there's a lot of like small companies that have had 20, 25, 30 people, four or $5 million in funding, you know, there's, there hasn't been like, you know, a big company has come in and said, okay, we're going to dominate this space. We're going to own this space. And I think that's why we've tried to grab that mantle and say, the problems that we're solving are super complex, right? So, you know, that, that requires a resource, right? It requires an incredible level of resource. And the, the challenges that we're trying to solve and the level of fidelity that we and our partners want to get to is not simple. So that requires a huge investment. It's why, like, you know, we've raised like, close to $85 million over the last number of years. Um, and it's why we're now, you know, 135 like people in the company. We're trying to add, we just announced a couple of weeks ago, we're trying to add another 112 people over the next 10 to 12 months. Um, and it's because we, like we believe like you know, they're, they're, this industry deserves better. The technology has to improve and the expectations of the industry have continued to rise. The emergence of more capital into the industry, um, you know, the, the ownership changes that we've seen in elite sport, there's smart money and like, and very modern business people coming into elite sport. And, and the, that, if you couple that and their expectation, what they've seen in modern business, and then their expectations that, of course, they would have in the sports business that they, that they now own. And this massive explosion of data that we've had across the industry. And um, the stage is set, right? The stage is set. And that's why, like, you know, going and really attacking that and somebody that having the ambition and the drive and the courage to really say, like, we're going to go and do this and we're going to do it differently. And we're, go we're going to attack this and give people what we believe they need and, or, like, raise a standard across this industry, like, that's what gets us excited every morning. Do you fully believe it, it's it's this mass, this both both size of of team as well as the the, the backing of money behind it to really tackle this problem? It requires this. Oh, absolutely! Like the 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 complexity of the issues, the the people that we're solving them for, the level that they're playing at, and. Um, it demands a level of quality, right? And, and you know, I think you, you can't get to that. You can't tackle huge problems about resources, right? You need, you need a lot of people. You need a lot of capabilities. You need to be able to deploy the best technology. You need to be able to pay for that. Are you seeing uh, any pushback when, when you're sharing this concept and saying, hey, we, we're, we're spending a lot of money. We're, we're trying to tackle this, but people are saying, I don't get it. I don't care. Or is everyone saying, yes, give it to me? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I think, you know, a number of years ago, we probably, there probably was pushback in the industry and there probably was people that were concerned and thinking like, oh, is this really going to happen? I'm not sure. We're just seeing these wearables come in. We're just seeing these optical trackers, but we're not sure we're, we're going to use it. And people do not have a choice. The level of competitiveness within the industry has skyrocketed. TV revenue, sponsorship, merchandise, the amount of money that has been spent on that right now, who gets it? The people that are winning get it, right? People that are winning, the people that are performing at the highest level, the people that are picking up trophies are getting it. So if like, and we've seen teams lean forward, get involved in this age of performance intelligence, and they've been making strides and they've been improving. And we've seen teams like, you know, pick up like trophies that you would never would have expected years ago because they've leaned into this. And that's meant that others have had to follow. And the reality is like, there is no choice. If this, this happens to every industry. Like they turn to data, they turn to analytics, they turn to intelligence. It happens in every industry and it changes industries. And we saw it with like, you know, Blockbuster and, and, and Netflix, right? If you ignore it, if you ignore this, you do so at your pearl and you can have an enormous business and you can be a huge organization. And overnight you realize that you are five years behind and guess what? You don't have five years anymore and it's over. 
And I think, you know, I, I think the industry understands that. I think um, there is a huge appetite for, you know, for people to do more. And the reality is the investment that's already been made in technology today is huge. So why not like maximize that investment? Why not maximize that data? Why not like turn that into intelligence, do something powerful with it? For those that want to learn more, you can head over to kitmanlabs.com. That's K-I-T manlabs.com. Stephen, thank you for, for sharing your passion, your desire to change this whole ecosystem, this, this industry and giving intelligence. Thanks for, for spending some time with us. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this. And we'll see you all on the next episode of Optech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know. Mm-hmm.